Mr. Craig Stevens, hello, my friend. How are you? Hello. How you doing, fella? All right. Yeah, all the better for seeing you, mate. Um, obviously, podcast yeah. listeners won't know this, but this is our second attempt at trying to kick the podcast off. We've now got you in a different room with a more stable connection. But did I spot a big jar of whiskey in your last batch drop? That was the first thing that caught my eye, or have I completely misinterpreted that? Yeah, you got a few drinks in there, because I had that office built back in COVID times. So, right. um, like a lot of people, started working from home. And um, worked in the conservatory, and the kids used to know I was in there. So they used to be as good as gold until they saw me on the phone. Right. And then it'd be like, dad, 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 you know. And, um, yeah, it got on my nerves. So I had a purpose-built office, uh, big enough that you can put a couple of chairs in there. I've got a right move sign saying we're open, we're closed, um, yeah. all that kind of thing. So I'm um, just to try and make it a bit more homely, got the uh, – yeah, got the decanter, some water, uh, whiskey in there, some. But it's um, I don't have it very often, to be fair. I'm virtually teetotal, so it's uh, it's more for if I get guests in there, if anything. I was gonna say, mate, because to see like a half drinking bottle of whiskey at ten o'clock in the morning, I didn't know when yeah. to celebrate or be concerned. But uh, no, good, good to have the backstory, Craig. Uh, but anyway, whiskey to one side. Uh, how's life treating you? Yeah, really good, really good. Um kind of a, just over a week into the exp journey now um it's a lot look so much different it's so more relaxing as well it's bizarre because for everyone that kind of doesn't i suppose know um obviously spent the best last part of the last well best part of the last six years at, at purple bricks and three of, the, of those years has been incredibly busy as um obviously an area director that you take about 100 calls a day so to go from a, a really big team taking 100 telephone calls a day, one phone's ringing here, one phone's ringing here, you've got your laptop, and it's literally just on the go, nonstop, to taking five or six calls a day. Um, yeah, so it, it's a lot more, it's a lot more relaxed. Yeah. I don't have to panic when the phone's going again. Yeah, yeah, the, the transition is huge, mate. And, and I know, and I'd be interested to ask you, actually, how have you adapted to that change in pace because i know a lot of people and probably myself included actually at one point in time thinking back you can almost feel like because you used to being so busy and now i guess you're working smarter rather than harder you know you've got the potential to earn much more money but with much less time invested but the practicalities of every day not answering 100 calls it can be quite an adjustment so have you coped okay are you quite enjoying that new pace or do you feel as though you're sort of at a loose end and you're scratching around for things to do like how has that impacted on you no Sorry. you have to i suppose it's one of those when anybody launches you know you're launching a new business you just have to have a structure to the day um and i've always kind of done this and um i know a couple of my friends kind of laugh that you know i get up every day and i kind of dress that even if i've got any anything on or not um you know, i've got friends that are in the exp that get up they put the hoodie on and uh put the joggers on and just work in front of the laptop i have to kind of be in that business mode um so even if let's just say i've got one appointment at one or three o'clock in the afternoon i still get up do the school run in the morning but i'm like chinos on brogues on shirt on um whack the blazer on and um so i was probably still probably maybe the smartest dressed dad at the school gates mm -hmm. um not little do they know then i kind of come back and obviously they have, you know not bustling into the office at 9 a.m yeah, but yeah. um yeah, that gets you kind of in the in the in the frame of mind because otherwise you can just sit and think I've got a few hours to myself, and I think if you do that, the time will tick away very quickly, the days will tick away very quickly, and before you know it, you could be a couple of months down the line thinking, "Crikey, now I'm like rushing to try and get business." So I think um, I put a post on LinkedIn actually, I think yesterday or the day before, saying. I kind of changed my mindset a bit about six months ago where I always wanted to get something positive out of the day because where I said I was taking a hundred calls a day, a lot of those could be complaints. A lot of those could be you know, grumbles and it can kind of, you know, although I'm not working in a factory and you're not, you know, coming home physically drained, you can be mentally drained. Um, so about six months ago, I changed my mindset where, I just wanted to make sure I got something positive out of every single day. Um, and so even that works brilliantly now I'm at EXP because although I said I'm not taking 100 calls a day, 
I can think, okay, look, I might have one thing in my diary today, but what, at the end of the day, what can I say to myself that I've done something really, really positive? And that could be, I said, getting a second viewing on a house or booking a valuation in or something that you can finish the end of the day going, that was worth it. I've got something yeah. out of today. Yeah. And I think it's yeah. really important. I think that's massive. And there's like a, an old saying, which I didn't come up with, but I've heard it somewhere. And I always repurpose this as though I invented it, but I didn't. But it's not every day is a good day, but every day has good. And as long as you can go to bed at night thinking, you know what, I did this today, or I've had this impact, or I've made this shift, and I've done something that moves the dial on where I want to take things on my progress, then you can kind of put your head to bed at night kind of knowing that it's it's been a solid day and you've moved in the right direction but Craig you just kind of touched on there just just in general conversation about your sort of past experiences and whatnot and I think anyone who's clicked onto this podcast having recognized your name they'll probably know you as the purple bricks guy because that's what I was familiar with, as noticing you as for a long time because you've obviously been banging it purple bricks drum for a little while you've had great success there you've helped a lot of people build businesses under the purple bricks banner over the years but your career in property started long before that if i'm not wrong i think you've been around now for a couple of decades in one role or another selling properties so just give us a quick sort of you know a couple of minute backstory really about your experience about where you've come from and the sort of transition that you've had in your own career over the years and um, just so people know a bit more about you yeah so it's interesting actually because a lot of people i did meet up with um I've got someone else who's very very experienced actually in the area I am and when I was having a coffee with him a couple of weeks ago he said oh Craig I actually I didn't realize you know how long you'd been in the industry I know you from Purple Bricks because yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know, he'd seen obviously a lot of my social media and kind of pretty much thought that's you know I originated from there but um, yeah I kind of originated a long long time before before that kind of happened so I suppose going back um, like a lot of people I didn't plan to be an estate agent um i actually went into travel so that's how i kind of was so i used to be a um a holiday rep um and it's one of those jobs to be fair even now if someone paid me a million pounds a year that holiday rep job would probably still be the best job i've ever had really um, <laughs> it was, yeah it was so that was one probably you know an incredible job and luckily it was one of those jobs that i did before things like facebook came out right right <laughs> Uh, but it was good. Yeah. So I worked abroad for quite a few years. Um, so I was always used to kind of getting up and talking in front of people. I remember when I, you know, I worked for First Choice and they said, you've got to get up and, you know, stand up in front of people and do this presentation. I was like, yeah, no worries. Thinking it'd be about a dozen people. Stood up in front of this stage, walked out and realized there was about 150 guests. Oh, wow. Make good life like, skills, though. Incredible so life like, skills. Oh. Yeah. So you learn really quickly, right? And I was like, crikey, you dropped me in here. You didn't tell me there was this many people. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, after travel, I realized there wasn't as much money in it and kind of um, had a few friends that were in estate agents. They were driving far better cars than me and everything. And I thought, actually, that's the route to go down. So I um, I started back like nearly 20 years ago now, William H. Brown. So it was a, a lot of people started obviously back in that corporate mold. Um, so I did that kind of 20 years ago. Lasted like six years. I was a branch manager running a really, really successful estate agent. And it was one of those that now thinking back, it was a really good thing that happened. They kind of gave me a pay cut and they kind of said to me, I had this meeting. They said, you earned too much money last year. Oh. And I said, well, how can I earn too much money? And they said, well, the commission for your branch manager job is X amount. And you earned more than that because we broke every sales record there was in, um, in Leicester. And they said, so, your OTE, you made too much money. And I said, well, that's impossible. You know, you're only paying me the commission. So in theory, if you paid me a million pounds commission, it's because I'm making you 10 million pound profit, you know. Yeah, so yeah. They, you can't make too much commission. That doesn't make sense. And uh, they said, well, look, we've worked it out. Don't worry. It's only if you do the same figures this year as last year, you'll, you know, the only difference is you'll lose 1,500 pounds a month, uh, 1,500 quid a year. And that annoyed me even more because I thought, you're only actually now, you're telling me I'm only worth 1,500 quid. You know, so I handed my notice in and um, I went to a, a very well-known franchise actually in Leicester called Newton Fallowell. Yeah, um, yeah I've heard of went there. Yeah, they've got loads of offices all over the Midlands. Um, went there, so took on that business. That business had lost 70 grand the year before. So one of my friends was kind of talking to me into going and taking on that franchise. And I was like, crikey make or break me this franchise you know it's lost 70 grand the year before 
So that was my first step into self self-employed estate agency. I was married, had a little one, had a mortgage, had a couple of cars. So did, you, then... did you purchase the franchise? You actually bought the Well, you say business. bought it. Yeah, I was supposed to buy it. And um, they wanted, well, I, tell you, I don't mind telling you, they shouldn't talk thing, but they wanted 60 grand for this uh, this franchise. And I was like, but you've made like 70 grand lots. And I was like, I don't know where the 60 grand comes from. And uh, my business partner at the time said, oh, Craig, I've haggled. We've got it for 50 grand now. And I went back and I said, look, I'll happily take the franchise, but I want it for nothing. And they said, well, that doesn't make sense. You know, why would it, nothing? We want 50 grand for it. I said, but it's not worth anything. The, the first day you give me the keys, you're already better off because every single day you're not making, you know, you're not making a loss. So we took um, we took the business in the end. They took it. So we took it for free. Uh, we took the stock. We took the office, went in there, revamped, spent seven, yeah, four months working seven days a week. That was my you know, first experience of being self-employed because I thought, look, I'm, I have to get, you know, I can't afford to take a business on that's lost 70 grand. Um, that first year made 25 grand a year profit. Amazing. So, you know, big swing. Yeah, big yeah. Swing. Um, and then we built on from it. So we built on from it. I opened a lettings franchise. I've never done lettings in my life. So I started going on lettings courses and we built up this lettings franchise. Then I, um, I took on a Newton Fallot, a uh, Fine and Country franchise. And it just grew and it grew. So we were six years into that. Um, and then, yeah, someone came along to say, look, can I can I buy it? Can I buy the business? Um, I owned three franchises, but ran four because I didn't own the Finding Country one. Right. Um, so we, yeah, sold all three Newton Fallow franchises, lost the Finding Country one. And um, I thought, what am I going to do then? Because now all of a sudden I've got X amount in the bank um uh, made me quite you know financially quite it was healthy but now I was kind of then right I'm back I've been self-employed for six years what do I do now and someone said uh, I had a lot of friends at Purple Bricks at the time and it was that time of Kenny and Michael and big conferences Exciting, new innovative different transforming yeah. the space I thought look okay um I don't know the online estate agency model it wasn't something that was massive you know six years ago um let's try it Worst case scenario, I'll learn a lot about the online estate agency model. Best case, let's see where it takes me. And uh, I planned to go there kind of for about a year, really. And um, that was it. You know, I've been there nearly six years. But funny enough, about three, maybe three, four years ago, I did have my notice in. So right. I did have my notice in with Purple Bricks. And I was literally launching, again, my own estate agency brand with a friend um, called Regal Park. And we were going to launch that. We got the boards ordered. We did everything. And, um, yeah, I was really excited. So it was kind of, again, before the EXP model was around and everywhere else. And I wanted to go on my own again. And uh, thought, look, I'll launch something for myself. So we got everything ready. I handed in my notice. And um, my director at the time, sales director, said, Craig, don't do that. He said, literally, please just give me two months. Um, I've got a job coming along that will blow your socks off. And I said, OK, I'll give it a couple of months, um, waited two months and lo and behold, then got one of the territory owner jobs. And obviously back then, there probably wasn't. I mean, there'll be a few people on this podcast that argue this case, but there probably back then wasn't many of the better jobs. I thought in the industry, you're earning a huge amount of money, yeah, yeah. You, had, you know, and you had a great everyone was self-employed. You, I think you had the team that I inherited looking after Northampton and Coventry. Um, I'm still friends with you know, several of those people and they were brilliant estate agents and I just loved it. I loved working with self-employed people that had that entrepreneurial, they wanted to be better. And, and I'm said to everyone, look, I'm not here to be your boss. Yes. You might have a tag of area director. I really couldn't care by then what your tag was. Couldn't be care, care if you were called bin man or area director, but I just wanted, I said, look, what I will do is I'll try and help you make more money. Um, I said, I've been self-employed for six years. You know, I've run these businesses. Some of them have been from cold starts and they've been successful, right? Because they, they, they've been successful businesses. So what I will do is I'll help you make more money. And you can either listen to me or you don't have to listen to me, but I'm not going to force it. You know, you're self-employed. But it went really well. Um, and it was great. And uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a brilliant time. So I spent a good three years doing that. And then obviously, lo and behold, the time came where Purple Bricks stopped that 
I suppose, glory, you know, gravy train, however you want to call it. And everyone then went employed. Mm. And I suppose the downside then was um, some of the some of the great people that had, you know, really good entrepreneurial skills, they wanted to be self-employed. They left. And a lot of people were leaving the business. A lot of my team were leaving the business. They just didn't want to be employed. And the money you could make, you know, we talk about risk and reward being self-employed. Yes, you're employed and you've got that salary coming in and you've got that, you know, people say job security, but how much job security is it in reality compared to self-employed? You know, you got up and every day and all that effort you made, the rewards, if you put the effort in, were, were fantastic at the end of it. Um, and then people kind of left and they went, I can do this on, you know, better on my own. So a lot of people left, they launched their own estate agents. So I've got a lot of friends now that, that yeah, have their own estate agents. Um, and that was, you know, 18 months of being employed. And over probably about a year into that PB journey being employed, I started thinking again, I kind of missed the self-employed bit. I missed the creativity. I missed the entrepreneurial bit. You would kind of go to your bosses and say, look, I've got this great idea. This is how it will work. This is how it could benefit the business. But they can't make a decision either because it has to go above so many pay grades. And then it will kind of come down the filter again. Well, yeah, not yet. So that's, a you know, that's just a lot of corporate estate agents. Um, you know, there's too many people in the chain above you. Yeah. yeah. And, mate, I love, like, I love having these conversations. I love having podcasts because you get into detail that maybe you wouldn't if you was just kind of having a general conversation sometimes because obviously it's industry specific. But I never knew that you created that 100K swing in a franchised office, by the way, and grew up a little empire. So, mate, massive props to you. Not many people can say that they've uh, taken hold of a business in this space and built it to a level of profitability where they've managed to create an exit. I managed to do it to a, a small level. I know Adam's done it and a few other people have dotted around, but that's that, that's an incredible achievement. So props to you. And I guess your journey really, looking back with hindsight, it kind of follows the bell curve of innovation in the space really in that you started you know in a corporate environment kind of learning your craft working to targets no doubt working your way up to branch manager you then went into the traditional way of building a business you know you make a big investment or in your case you don't make a big investment but you take a risk you build it up in the conventional way into the online space and now finally where you are in kind of the exp framework tell me like over that period of time what main changes have you seen in the property space and what character traits have you noticed from all the agents that you've employed or you've been in business with through purple bricks or through running the Farrell, um, the Newton Fallowell um, franchises that ultimately separate a good estate agent from a poor one? Like what are the main character traits and abilities that you see as a bit of a bell curve? Um, so trait wise, I suppose, if you go, I always used to say to every single person that look, I you know, spoke to, I recruited or I, I work with, I would say, look, don't chase the money. It's a really hard thing to say to people because a lot of people look. you want some people to come into the business and they want them, you know, they want to drive a Lamborghini or want to drive or have a Rolex or a big house or vice versa. But I always used to say, look, just don't chase the money. Put, you know, put the money to one side. Just forget about money. I know you need money to pay the mortgage and everything else, but just forget about money for one thing. Because if you chase the money, you'll just be like, um, just like a little Jack Russell going round and round chasing its tail. And nothing will ever be good enough. And you'll just be chasing things, right? I always used to say, just forget that. And your first goal, first and foremost, should just be to have the aim of having the best reputation. Because if you have the goal of just having the best reputation and all you care about, I said, forget money, all you care about is customer service, making the customer the be all and end all and giving an amazing service. Your reputation will go through the roof and then you won't need to chase money because business will come directly to you. And that's the easiest way, right? Because marketing is expensive. And when you're going out and you're spending money to try and get business, if you can have the best reputation and business is coming directly to you, um that's the best thing to do and yeah so some of the i would say the best people were those people that weren't running out every day to try and make every single gram and they would spend more time ringing customers ringing vendors giving good feedback having conversations rather than sales pitches um people that would if a house had been on the market for a couple of months and it hadn't sold those people would go back into the living room make an effort to go and sit with a vendor 
Here's a and, question. Sorry, Greg. It's just something that's come into my mind that I kind of need to ask because otherwise we'll go away in conversation and I'll forget to come back to it. I agree 100% with that mindset. It's all right having that mindset if you're uh, an employed area director, you want a salary, or maybe if you're kind of doing what we're doing now. When you was paying for a branch, paying for right move, paying for Zoopla, paying for staff salaries, did you have that mindset even when you was paying all the bills? Or was you kind of stuck in, yeah, but I don't want you in an appointment for two hours because that means that you're not over here doing this and I'm paying you a wage and we've got another appointment. Like, was that always your mindset or was that evolved over time with your experience in the space? I'd be interested to know if that was... I would say, I would say it probably did, it was probably half and half, but more right. evolved. My... I always had that mindset of I wanted the best reputation. Yeah. But at the same time, I couldn't be have the best reputation and be broke. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it wasn't it wasn't great to, you know, be broke and have a great reputation. So I would say it was probably 50-50. I needed to go out and get some money, but with that mindset. So I had to try and do both. So every instruction I did get, I would work my backside off to make sure that person had a, a five-star experience. Um, I did try and make sure I got Google reviews and, and everything else off people to try and build that, build that up. Um, so, yeah, you obviously need the business, but I just worked with every single person so much. And I probably worked with people, clients, maybe more than I should have. Some people will say, you know, you spent probably more time with that client than maybe what you, you should do. And maybe you could have moved on to the next one. And, yeah, if I had done that, I probably would have got some you know, more transactions through the door but it helped me build the business in the long run. And that's what you kind of got to think of, you know, in the long run, what is my goal? 100%. And mate, that's, couldn't agree more. And I think now I recognize that, I know it sounds a bit cliched and a bit cheesy and probably a bit repetitive at this stage because you jump on LinkedIn and see someone with a variation of this message, but we are in the people business. And, you know, this is, you know, you look at the lifetime value of a client and the lifespan of your business, you know, there's a much, a sort of more holistic sort of macro view that you need to take on your business. Whereas in the past, when I've run my own agencies, I've been the first to admit I've had the wrong mindset where I've employed people and I've almost had that dialer mentality that, you know, we sit in, we plug in, we blast 150 calls a day, we strive for conversions, targets, KPIs. And that was how I ran my businesses in the past. Whereas now I couldn't be further removed from that mindset. But I guess sometimes you only evolve your mindset through experience, right? Through going through um that curve i guess of education to kind of come out the other side so i think we're in a better place now and what you've said is i think to a t perfect it just took me a long time personally to connect the dots on that for myself <laughs> yeah and i think it i think it is just something you kind of with age as well you know mm -hmm. um, when you're a bit younger you just want the fastest car the best watch the biggest house you know as you get a bit older i think your priorities do kind of naturally just change and you want a bit more family time and you know those kind of things so i think it then naturally changes but look you know when i first started out i don't think the likes of you know we're you know, exp the likes of purple bricks all of those i don't think they would have worked anyway yeah because we weren't ready for that right back then 20 years ago they weren't as you know if i had spoke to my parents you know and said look here's an iphone or they wouldn't have had a clue so that wouldn't have kind of worked so i think look um those corporate companies, I think if I was starting off again today as an estate agent and I wanted to get into the industry, the the William H. Browns, the Connells, the Hearts, the Countrywides, the, all of those big corporate companies, I think they're probably the best step to get into. 100%. Uh, the KPIs are quite, you know, they're quite, they're quite, quite bullish. So you have to go out, you know, you learn that good work ethic. They have brilliant coaching, brilliant training um it, they are great companies to start out with the only downside is you get i think with those companies you get to a level the pay isn't really great mm -hmm. so i think a lot of people hit a certain level and then think i'm as i'm worth more now and mm -hmm. they also have around and then you kind of go off and you go to a big independent or you go out on your own so i would probably still do exactly the same I agree, mate. And I think that, you know, as much as we, and, and of course, we're doing what we're doing now and the sort of journeys we've been on in our own careers and businesses, you know, we bang the drum for more autonomy, more freedom, the agent building a better life, making more money, playing by their own rules. And all those things are well and good, but it all starts with 
you know, you need to get yourself a foundation, right? You need to learn your craft. You need to understand what you do, what you don't do, how to, how to optimize conversions, how to best market a property, how the industry works. And I just look at like Becky, my partner, she's an avid writer. She's a copywriter. She l absolutely loves English language and literature. She pays 70 grand to go through an education curve of university to get all the credentials, all the right experience before going into a paid role. She was minus 70K to get to that point. Whereas albeit salary might not be great in commission might not be great in agency but if you've never sold a house and you think that a vendor is a machine that spits out kit cats there's worse places to be than getting paid 15 to 20 grand to learn your craft to get that education to come out the other side to then come into something like exp or similar where you can earn you know lion's share of the revenue and build a, a tremendous future for yourself and your family so you know there's there's worse ways to get your education i think and that's the way that i'd look at it. it's almost like a schooling um to kind of lay those foundations to get those pillars in place to build from in the future. Yeah, hundred percent. And look, I think I'm kind of it's a tricky. I I've been one of those. I haven't really got any. Um, I haven't really got any sob stories or anything bad that's happened to me in a state agency. I've been quite lucky, right? Touchwood. I've been quite lucky over those twenty years. That kind of you know that corporate mm. started well. That you know my luckily luckily the effort I put in in doing my franchises took off my experience at pb was great and i would say look purple bricks looked after me very very well um and i've got nothing bad to say about any of the estate agents i worked for you learn something from every single one of them um and that's the way you should look at it right um just take something positive from every single step and it's led me here now where you know i obviously wanted to get back out of you know back out into the world again and go um look let's where i took those franchises let's do this again with exp but without the the big office because i don't think you need that anymore you know let's let's do that again let's get out there let's be self-employed let's build something and i think there's something um very special or refreshing from going out there and trying to build something for yourself without question mate and you say that you know you've gone through your purple bricks experience and that's led you to where you are now. But I'd argue that that's led us all to where we are now. Cause I genuinely going back to your point about timing, I genuinely don't think that we could be here doing what we're doing at the level and scale that we're doing it without purple bricks coming along very well funded and paying for that education, educating the consumer that there's a different way of doing it, educating the agent that there's a different way of working. And both of those things I think have kind of laid a path for us to kind of bolt on the next evolution of, of that model of thing to better serve the agents. So, you know, whilst I've, you know, I'd mixed reviews of Purple Bricks in the past, but I worked there myself. They looked after me. I got on really well with everyone that I worked um, with at the time. Some fantastic agents have come through that framework. Some fantastic agents still exist in that framework. I'm nothing but grateful to Purple Bricks personally for the kind of path that they laid for us to kind of come into. And that sort of takes us on to where we are now with your story, Craig. And one thing that I was going to ask, and maybe you just touched on it yourself there when you started alluding to the think about offices and whatnot and you mentioned it was only three or four years ago you'd sort of put your, your notice into purple bricks to set up a business with a friend of yours you've now come to the end of that cycle at purple bricks come to the crossroads and instead of picking up the mantle and setting up the business that you was going to do previously you've instead kind of you know owned the craig stevens brand and joined exp and you're looking to take that route to, to build your future so what's the main reason that you've kind of come to exp i guess rather than stepping out of purple bricks with all the experience that you've now got instead of doing it alone alone if that makes sense what were the key sort of driving influences that made you take the route that you did um money and reputation. money and reputation and if i kind of um push those both to one side kind of give you a bit of an idea so you still and why i say money i said you, you should never chase the money you should always have, want to have the best reputation but two things one you kind of want financially to be a bit more secure and you want obviously to have a, a great reputation and i suppose the way i was looking at it and it's got to be careful because i don't want to kind of put P, pb down as i said I, I had a great experience there i've got loads of friends there my you know only left my teams you know just over a week ago but the service levels probably weren't where i would want them to be i'm pretty sure uh, even people at pb or a lot of people would say that the service levels weren't really there and that's quite hard when your really reputation means everything to you and you're very much reputation driven it's really hard when you can't impact some of that 
you know, because it's such a big company. Um, and I just wanted to get back to, you know, some of, the th some of the things didn't sit well with me. And I thought, look, it's getting on my, it's kind of getting on my nerves a little bit. Um, so, check, yeah, going back on my own, I'm in control of my reputation. Um, that was one huge thing. And obviously the money as well. Um, you know, you when I was self-employed, I've always earned more money than when I was employed. You know, that's quite simple. I've always earned more money. Um, and this was quite an interesting thing, actually. I hired a guy, and I won't say his name on here, um, but I hired a guy who had been a branch manager at William H. Brown for 11 years. And he came to, to, to PB with us. And he said within his first paycheck was the best paycheck he'd had in 11 years. Wow. Um, and I remember when I, obviously I was self-employed owning my franchises. I went, you know, I was then going to be self-employed with PB. I turned up at my job interview. It's such as, it's not really you know, an interview, but turned up to join PB. And for those that know me wouldn't know that, Although, yes, reputation is everything. I still liked nice things because that's what happens when, you you know, you can be successful. And I turned up at my interview. The guy turned up in his car and it was, you know, 20 grand, nice, nice car, 20 grand car. And I turned up in my Porsche 911 for my interview to join PB. And um, and I've had quite a few nice cars like that. And I thought, you know what? Now I'm employed, though. Could I go again and buy a nice house? I've got two young kids. Can I, you know, can I go on nice holidays with them? Can I, if I wanted to go out and buy a Porsche again tomorrow, can I do that on my wages when you're employed? Because you're taxed a lot as well, right? And I thought the answer is you'd struggle. You could probably do it, but you'd save up a lot and you're taxed a lot. Yet when you're, when I've been self-employed, I've generally earned twice as much. Mm. Okay. Um, and also that's a conversation, a complete conversation for the benefits of, tax reasons for being employed and self-employed mm -hmm. but um that was kind of one of the biggest reasons as well i thought look if i actually go back with you know go back self-employed go down the route of exp i'm building something that i'm in control of the rep my reputation so that's one of the most important things and two i have the possibility and the potential to build up my own business like previously and earn more money and obviously earning more money means financially my family is a bit more secure um so they were kind of the, the two reasons and i had people you know lots of friends that were on the high street um that i mean if i i don't mind dropping one name in tony ruby for example everyone knows who i worked with him at newton fallowell he's gone off at exp been incredibly successful and there's been a few other guys at exp that i know that i've worked with that then, yeah, I absolutely um, loving loving life at EXP. And I looked at a lot of business models, and there's a few out there. Um, you know, one of my friends, James, has got the Avenue, and they're doing incredibly well there. And I looked at a lot of business models and thought, which one would suit me best? And it wasn't just about the business model. It was about the people I could work with as well. And ironically, obviously, Brenton Smith, who a lot of people know, um, I'd worked with him at Purple Bricks. He's obviously at EXP. Um, I've been friends with him for quite a few years. And I wanted a few people that I could also run ideas off, pick up the phone, still run ideas off. Um, so you weren't on your own own. You know, because yeah. I could have gone and, I could have gone and opened like Craig Stevens estate agents and not done it through the EXP route. But then sometimes that's, I think people... that's, that's what that that is what I was wondering, because when I kind of opened up with that question and you answered it brilliantly well, but the, the thread that I was trying to sort of pull on in my mind was you could have got more money, you could have had more autonomy, more control, you could have had, you know, been future proofing your reputation a lot more, leaving paper bricks and going and setting up alone alone. So I was wondering why EXP and not alone alone, as other people have tried to do to varying levels of success. Was it more about that collaboration, that community, that having like minded people around you? Was it financially driven? Was it a combination of the two? Like what 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 spread so, out that um, Look, two things. Um, and I saw a post of yours actually that probably hit, and here's go. So I saw a post of yours that hit the nail on the head, which was I think there was you having a coffee with someone else at EXP, and you talked about look, this isn't the reason you will join EXP, but this is one of the reasons you won't leave. And 
but and I remember kind of thinking about that quite a lot because I said, you can go out. I, you, I can launch Craig Stevens estate agents tomorrow and someone else can live, you know, launch Joe Bloggs estate agents tomorrow. But you are really on your own. And yes, you've got your own name above the door on your own branding and you probably got a little bit more freedom. But also there's a lot more expense to it. And there's not a lot of people then to bounce ideas off because, you know, yeah. it's hard going down that route. Um, well, at least when I had the franchises, for example, at Newton Farrell, there were still people at Newton Farrell you could pick up the phone and you could have a chat to. And I saw EXP very much like that, that, they're yes, you're still, you know, your name's on your boards. It's pretty much your, you know, it's you. You're in control of everything. You can't change the branding, but it's still your business. You still have to get up every day and you still have to make everything work. Um, but I like the fact there was a lot more support there. Um, even like now, you know, some of the, the meetings that are going on and agent, you know, agent driven training. I love agent driven training because it's far better listening to your peers and how successful they are and what they're doing right than listening to someone who just sits in an office yeah. saying, I think you X, Y and Z, but they don't do it themselves. Yeah. So that was a big part. And the other bit is if I worked out also, if I open Craig Stevens estate agents tomorrow and start paying 1500 quid every month for right move and my CRM and my website and everything else. I worked out it's about two and a half grand a month. And PB was, and um, EXP was like 150 quid a month. And you're kind of like, by the time you even do six months in, you've blown 30 grand. Well, actually that money could be saved and I could keep that and use that to invest in marketing and the business to grow even further. Yeah. So um, yeah, that was probably, you know, the, those two reasons, having that collaboration with other people and also, it's an e it's a far cheaper and easier option. As I said, rather than blowing money to Right Move, I'd rather not give Right Move that money. I'd rather keep it and use it on marketing to grow my business. Yeah, exactly. So you, you kind of invest it more into, um, I guess, uh, activities that are more conducive towards growth and achieving your goal and broadening that impact and, and working with more clients. But it's interesting what you say there. It's good that you brought up Tony's name because I think a lot of the time. You know, when people have had 5, 10, 15, 20 years working in the industry, and I've been in this mindset myself before, you kind of think, well, I've been there, I've done it, I've had every conversation, I've wore every hat and every T-shirt, what else can I learn? But it's only really when you sit in a room with other people that have got similar backgrounds or even, you know, varied backgrounds where they're coming in and bringing new ideas to the table and Tony did a session only this week actually about um, and I, I jumped in and I attended it it, it was about um, how to tap into your local community and Tony is is someone not the only agent but one of the more prominent agents that's brilliant you know getting to know local business owners doing things for his local community really getting to understand uh, people within the town that he operates and he was kind of sharing some of the hints and the tips and some of the progress and the conversations and the impact that he's had by following that as a I guess it's a lead generation strategy because it's now paying him back incredibly well in terms of the growth that Tony Ruby branding Grantham, but he's not doing it with that intention. He's doing it with a focus on doing the right thing. And I guess that kind of comes back to what you opened up the podcast with today, Craig, where you say, don't focus on profit, focus on the reputation and the profit will come. Sometimes you've got to look at those short term steps i guess that take you to the eventual goal but when you get too preoccupied with i want to generate leads i want to be known by everyone i want my brand everywhere i want boards in every street i want loads of money i want a porsche another porsche 911 when you start focusing on these things it can sort of distort the work that you've got to do in the short term and often derail people um so where obviously at this stage around the conversation you're only a week or two into starting your business with the xp so it's fairly early stages but i think now is quite a unique time for us to have the conversation about how that first few weeks has been for you as in the process of onboarding what it's been like going from taking 100 calls a day and many complaints as you mentioned before to suddenly you know being with a bottle of whiskey in your home office with control over building the Craig Stevens brand again in your local market what's that transition been like and what's the first couple of weeks been like um, as you sit here now very authentically in that seat yeah, so look, I, um, over Christmas, had a good idea that I was then going to hand my notice in, right? Um, had a good idea over Christmas. So I started, and anyone listening who's thinking about then doing something like this, I started, rather than kind of hand my notice in week one, start EXP week two, I thought, okay, I wanted to be a little bit, you know, I wanted to be organised. Um, so I started kind of getting, putting my board 
books together, putting my adverts, you know, my leaflets together, started putting a lot of my branding together. I wanted to be organized. I took that time to to make sure it was. So when I then kind of do go to launch, I'm not spending my first month trying to get a board put together or trying to, you know, put my um, letterhead note paper together or something. I wanted to do that. So I spent kind of a, a month doing that, right? Getting it all, getting it all ready. Um, so then when I did kind of launch, even before that, I started putting all on social media, started trying, really trying to build that build that up again. Um, and my first, funny enough, this week, obviously, my I've been here nine days now, nine days. My first two instructions did come from referrals of people who I'd sold before. So I had um, first telephone call came from a lady, Craig, you sold me a house three years ago. Um, we, you know, we enjoyed working with you. We're actually selling a buy to let property that we got would you come out and the nice thing is they didn't even have any other estate agents out they just called me from the experience before where it goes back to that reputation yeah uh, so and that's sold now so week one that's been listed wow. and um i then had another one where you talk about the money the difference in money you can kind of earn i had another couple that were looking to sell their property um i had sold their son's house for them about four years ago that was like an eight hundred odd thousand pound house. I sold that week, two weeks. Did it? He kind of raved about me, so they called me out. Um, bearing in mind, I had at the time no stock. You know, went into the living room. I've got no stock whatsoever. Nothing that I can say. By the way, I've just sold X, Y, and Z. The only thing yeah. I was holding on to was I'd sold their son's house and did a good, rep, you know, good uh, job on that. They had three really big estate agents out. Um, but luckily, you know, talked about what I would do for them. You'd be my first customer. Um, anyway, they ended up being my second customer because by the time they kind of came back to me. But that instructed. Um, and that's, a, a you know, a lovely house, prominent position. And that's a £10,000 fee. You know, so some people will take three months you know if that sells some people will take three months to, to sell that and ironically um it's not sold but i had an offer on it yesterday that i'm negotiating on i did a third viewing and a second viewing on it yesterday so let's you know fingers crossed it's absolutely incredible and what a start what um when you go in and i know that a few agents have tussled this in the past and i've got my opinion as to how you handle it but one of the concerns that people have is yeah but when i get called out to my first valuation and people ask oh you know when did you start your business what have you sold what have you been doing and you've not really got a great deal to kind of showcase to them how do you present yourself how do you pitch it how do you overcome that i think just look just be completely upfront and honest with them and just say you're just starting a new business um talk to tell them what you've done before um, the experience you can tell them of how many customers you've helped and been successful before and the reason why you're going on your own um, people like to work with you know smaller local oh, it's more more local people love that so no I like that lady I had I turned up at these two valuations I haven't got a house uh, with the first valuation, I couldn't even show them what my board looked like. I hadn't even designed my for sale board yet. Yeah, yeah. So it was really early, but I just said, look, you, you know, uh, this is what I do. It's <laughs> it's all about communication. Um, I talked about, I set them up on a WhatsApp group. I'll talk about that. I will speak to them weekly. It's me that does the viewings. It's me that does the negotiation. And I said, look, what's really important for you? Is it just to, to you know, to have floss in the office that does the viewings billy that does the the negotiating john that comes out and sees you or is it more important that you have one person that you can ring text whatsapp call and have that one-to-one -one with yeah. um i said no right or wrong mr vendor but you know what would you prefer some people just don't care and they happily deal with four or five people in a big office other people want really good communication and they said no we really want someone that we don't want to keep repeating ourselves over and over again. We want that one point, point, point of contact. And I said, well, that's exactly what you'll, you'll get with myself. Um, obviously, they, I, it was luckily, you know, I'd sold them a house a few years ago, so they knew I lived in the area. Uh, but I just said to them, look, I'm completely new. I'm starting a new business, but it is me. Um, I haven't got, and, and, you know, haven't got any properties yet. You could be my first homeowner. 
And people like that, you know, they like helping you get off the ground. I think they do, mate. I think people like to like back the little guy sometimes. And yeah. that, that was a, again, you talk about education and how things and, you know, mindset and approach changes over time. I don't know if this was the case when you left Purple Bricks, but when I was at Purple Bricks and when I've been in other roles in the past, I've followed the same sort of strategy. You know, the sales pitch was very much, we're the most positively rated agent in the UK. We've sold X amount of thousands of properties. And it was kind of like within your pitch, you're almost equating uh, scale and this this huge hill of social proof with credibility, whereas just getting to know people on a human level and understanding what's important to them and being able to give them that sort of more hands-on, bespoke, tailored service. For me, people sort of identify the value in having a bigger piece of your time. They've got more of your attention. So A, that's a USP to help the conversions, but also it normally helps decent fees follow because when people recognize well actually craig's got no properties so if we list his house if we list our property with craig we've got a hundred percent of his time a hundred percent of his focus a hundred percent of his attention if he doesn't sell it craig's not getting paid he's completely incentivized to get this through or else quite frankly he doesn't eat people kind of realize okay i've got a bigger piece of craig therefore i don't expect this to be a 500 pound you know, no sell, no fee service. They expect to pay, you know, five figure fees or, or more for it. So that that's definitely a big learning curve that I've had over the last few years as well. Yeah, well, and I would I would say to anybody that goes in the the living room, um, pre preempt the fact that you know there might be other estate agents coming out that are far, you know, have got big pie charts, have got a stock of a hundred houses. Just preempt that. But, you know, just say to them, look, I'll be completely honest. There are estate agents that have you know want to be the biggest estate agent in the village. Or the biggest estate agents, um, they've got, you know, hundreds of houses. I don't have any of that, but I don't have any intention to have any of that. Yeah, I don't have any intention to be the biggest estate agent in the village. I just want to be the best estate agent in the village, Mr. Bender. You know, and, and people like that. You know, I don't, it's not all about um, just numbers. You know, all I care about, the most important thing I care about with you, Mr. Bender, is that once I sell your house, you have a brilliant experience and you go and tell all your friends and family how amazing it was to work with me. That would mean the world to me because I will get business off the back of your recommendation. So yeah. I don't need to go and put 20 houses on the market, Mr. Vendor. You know, I only want to deal with a handful at a time, but your recommendations would mean the world to me. And, um, and I think kind of you know, people buy into that now. So, mate, and that just takes us completely full circle to the sentiment that we opened up the podcast with and, and something that's probably been an, an underlying theme of today's conversation, Craig, that reputation comes first. You know, your reputation is everything. And as long as you've got that nailed down and you're focused on those relationships, everything else follows. Um, so, mate, that's a brilliant way to, to kind of round up the podcast. So, Craig, thank you so much for taking the time to jump on, mate. It's been lovely to see your face. It's been lovely to chat to you properly. and been a real pleasure sort of unpacking your experience. So I appreciate you taking the time. No, look, thanks, Ben. And um, look, nine days into my XP journey, it's going well. I look forward to having a chat nine months into my XP journey. Oh, 100%, mate. It was so far so good, but many more hurdles ahead, I'm sure. But I look forward to seeing you tackle them with their flying colours, I'm sure. <laughs> good, man. Cheers, Craig. Cheers, Ben. Thanks, mate. Take care. Bye. Bye.